Hello, this is Sarah Bates, Communication Director at NHGRI App. I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Dennis Tyler. Dr. Tyler is an Associate Professor of English at Fordham University. An expert in African American literature, disability studies, and critical race studies, he is the author of Disabilities of the Color Line, which was published in 2022. His book skillfully explores the historical and ongoing anti-Black systems of division that maim, immobilize, and stigmatize Black people, which results in the entanglement of disability, disablement, and Black identity. He powerfully describes the entwining of racism and the ideology of ableism, but as importantly, how Black authors have embraced disability as a way of articulating the impacts of the dehumanizing practices of racism on their bodies and on their communities. His work also describes how Black authors have always understood disability as a kind of community and kinship, where the, the embrace of disability is key to present day and future transformative justice. His essays and reviews have been published in African American Review, Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, the Feminist Wire, Oxford Bibliographies, and American Literary History Online Review. You can follow him at Prof. Tyler. His presentation is entitled, The Problem of the Color Line in the Age of COVID-19. We will be taking questions from the audience afterwards. Professor Tyler, we are honored to have you join us as our keynote speaker today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that kind and generous introduction, Sarah. And thank you to everyone, how Mike Rimbus, Chris Donahue, Brittany Kish, Sarah Bates, and other folks at NHGRI for organizing this event. I am Dennis Tyler. I am a Black man, and my skin is the color of cinnamon sticks. I have thick Black glasses, a salt and pepper beard, and I'm wearing a cream sweater. I'm honored to be here with all of you to discuss a section from my new book, The Disabilities of the Color Line. The final stages of the writing and revising of the book occurred during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still ongoing. So I thought for today's talk, it would be fitting for me to discuss how both how the color line persists in the 21st century, especially during the pandemic and the movement for Black lives, and to discuss the historical understandings of the color line within Black literature and culture by briefly looking at the work of Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Francis Harper. As you'll see, I, I'll be moving back and forth from the present to the past to the present in my talk. I'm planning to speak for about 40 minutes, and I'm hoping that we'll have time to have a conversation about my talk, my book, or any other ideas my presentation may have sparked. As Sarah mentioned, the title of my talk is The Problem of the Color Line in the Age of COVID-19. Next slide. This is how Black people get killed, said Susan Moore, a Black woman doctor turned patient who was being treated for COVID-19 at IU Health North Hospital in Carmel, Indiana. Lying in her hospital bed with an oxygen tube hooked into her nostrils, Moore turned to social media to express her frustration about the poor treatment she received from the hospital staff in November and December 2020. As a physician herself, who understood her own ethical responsibility to protect the health of her patients, she recognized how her care was being compromised at this hospital. While Moore took issue with her patient advocate, as well as her on-call nurse, she described her doctor's behavior as especially egregious. First, her doctor downplayed her condition when she complained of a sharp pain in her neck. Then he wanted to prematurely send her home after only issuing her two drug treatments, stating that she did not qualify for more treatment because she did not appear to be out of breath. Finally, when Moore pressed the issue further, her doctor admitted that he felt uncomfortable giving her narcotics, making her feel, as she put it, like she was, quote, a drug addict, unquote. Only after Moore's that. CT scan revealed, quote, new pulmonary infiltrates all throughout her neck, unquote. Was she able to receive the care and drug treatment she needed to treat her condition? For more, 
The entire ordeal clarified an ugly and painful truth about the discriminatory treatment Black patients often receive from the medical establishment. Realizing, as the self-described Black lesbian mother warrior poet, mother warrior poet and feminist Audre Lorde has argued that, quote, your silence will not protect you, unquote, Dr. Moore decided to advocate publicly for herself. Despite her labored breathing, Moore went on Facebook to make everyone aware of what she experienced. I would now like to show two short clips of Dr. Moore, who is a Black woman speaking from a hospital bed with an oxygen tube in her nostrils. Next slide. You have to show proof that you have something wrong with you in order for you to get the medicine. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. And that man never came back and apologized. This Dr. Banny guy. And near the end of her video, Moore added this statement. Next slide. This is how black people get killed. When you send them home, and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. Dr. Moore's experience is a prime example of what the journalist and medical ethicist Harriet in Washington calls the United States' medical apartheid system. It is a system which has grossly mistreated and frequently withheld care from Black Americans to such an extent that their health profile stands in stark contrast to those of other Americans. Moore's story in particular captures the reasons for the health deficit experienced by Black women who often bear the burden of having to prove their pain who are accused of misrepresenting their condition or characterized as drug-seeking addicts, and who are typically underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed because practitioners do not take their symptoms seriously. The stress of having to deal with these issues can be overwhelming. Although she advocated for herself and demanded better care, a practice that, according to Moore's son, she has always done given her profession and her history of dealing with sarcoidosis, an inflammatory disease that commonly occurs in the lungs and lymph nodes. Dr. Moore did not win her battle against the coronavirus. Just more than a couple of weeks after she posted her video on Facebook, she died from complications of COVID-19 on Sunday, December 20th, 2020. Dr. Moore was one of many. The disproportionate rate at which Black people are being infected with, hospitalized for, or dying from COVID-19 has been staggering. According to an analysis by the Brookings Institution, the death rate for Black people is 3.6 times that for white people. In April 2020, the Washington Post observed similar disparities. Noting that the percentage of Black people dying from the virus is significantly higher than the percentage of bl the Black population in several states. In Louisiana, Black folks comprise 32% of the state's population, but have made up 70% of the deaths from COVID-19. In Illinois, Black folks are 14% of the state population, but make up 40% of its COVID-19 deaths. In Michigan, a similar phenomenon has been occurring. Black people comprise 14% of the population, but represent roughly 40% of those who have died from COVID-19. These numbers tell an alarming tale of how, to this day, the color line has severely compromised the health of Black Americans, creating racial health disparities that make them vulnerable to a deadly virus. Yet what is also disturbing is how politicians and commentators have been using these statistics to blame Black people for dying of the coronavirus. Next slide. This slide contains two items. The image on the left is of Ibn Kendi, a Black historian, a Black man with dreadlocks, wearing a pink shirt and a blue jacket. The image on the right is a quotation from Kendi, which I'll read in a second. 
As the historian Ibram Kendi observes, quote, to explain the disparities in the mortality rate, too many politicians and commentators are noting that Black people have more underlying medical conditions, but critically, they're not explaining why, or they blame the choices made by Black people or poverty or abuse or, or obesity, but not racism, unquote. Significantly, Kendi acknowledges that African-Americans suffer disproportionately from chronic diseases, <clears throat> such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, lung disease, obesity, and asthma, which make it harder for them to survive COVID-19. But he questions why politicians and health officials are not attempting to determine which structural barriers made it more likely for Black people to suffer from such chronic diseases. For example, when the host David Green asked Republican Senator Bill Cassidy on NPR's Morning Edition whether Black people's underlying health conditions are, quote, rooted in years of systemic racism, Cassidy replied, unquote, well, you know, that's rhetoric, and it may be, but as a physician, I'm looking at science, unquote. I would now like to listen to Senator Cassidy, who is also a U.S. medical physician, tell us what the science told him. Next slide. The audio might be slightly delayed. Um, there's an audio clip in this slide. Do you can you hear it? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be any audio playing on this slide. I will read it. Um, uh, Senator Cassidy says, if you have diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes and hypertension are clearly risk factors for problems from COVID, then African Americans are going to have more of those receptors that the virus likes to hit, inherent in their having the diabetes, the hypertension, and the obesity, and inherent in them having an overrepresentation of that. So there's a physiologic reason explaining this, unquote. With all the factors that could explain the racial health disparities of Black folks, including inadequate health care, lack of medical insurance, a scarcity of hospitals in majority Black communities, or the general racism and exploitation of the medical establishment, mm -hmm. Senator Cassidy repeatedly chose to diagnose Black people as having inherent health issues that make them more susceptible to COVID-19 rather than to discuss the precarious conditions set in motion by centuries of governmental neglect, violence, and indifference. This is an all too familiar narrative of the disabilities of the color line, a phrase that captures the historical and ongoing anti-Black systems of division that maim, stigmatize, and traumatize Black people, and represents them as being at fault for conditions they have been made vulnerable to. As I watched the racial pandemic unfold within the viral pandemic and listened to the various commentators discuss the causes of our country's massive health deficit, I realized that the story my book tells is as important to our current historical moment, the time of COVID-19, as it is to the ages of slavery and Jim Crow, two historical periods that take up a large portion of the book. One of the goals of my book is to encourage others to reconsider the intersections of Blackness and disability at a time when hard from narratives about racial health are on the rise. Next slide. <clears throat> Next. And here I'm showing a cover of my book for two reasons. First, I'm engaging in a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Wanted to remind you all that my book is available wherever books are sold or you can buy it directly from NYU Press. But I also wanted to show off this wonderful cover, which is by the Black disabled artist, Jack Whitten, entitled Black Monolith 2. He used a mix of materials to put it together, including acrylic, molasses, copper, salt, coal, ash, chocolate, onion, herbs, rust, eggshell. And if you were able to zoom in, you could see a razor blade in the middle of the, the mosaic. <clears throat> My book explores how Black people from the antebellum period to the present have been cast as disabled, as unfit for freedom, incapable of self-governance, and contagious within the national body politic. Such casting has been frequently resisted 
within the Black literary tradition to metaphorical reversals, where the color line is instead the disability or disorder that demands careful scrutiny. Yet the key contribution of this book lies in an, in an important observation that is overlooked in Black studies and disability studies. Rather than simply engaging in a prevailing narrative of overcoming, in which both disability and disablement are shunned alike, Black authors and activists have consistently avowed disability in varied, complex, and contradictory ways. Sometimes their affirmation of disability serves to clarify their own experience of racial injury, to represent how their bodies, minds, and health, how the bodies, minds, and health of Black people have been made vulnerable to harm and impairment by the state and anti-Black vigilantes. Sometimes their assertion of disability symbolizes a sense of community and commonality that comes not only from a recognition of the shared subjection of Blackness and disability, but also from a willingness to imagine and engender a world distinct from the dominant social order. Theirs, then, could be understood as an expression of interability compassion, a compassion of people with mixed abilities that is rooted in the practice of care and the twin pursuit of racial and disability justice. Their approaches are part of the larger traditions of Black radicalism and disability justice, and the Black writers and activists in this book employ the methods that make those traditions so formidable, the relentless pursuit for an elsewhere, the steady movement toward an elsewhere, and the exceptional aptitude to envision and occasion otherwise. The color line has a long history, and it has been shaped as much by disability as it has by race, sexuality, gender, geography, and sound. It has been a serious delimitation on the health and life of Black folks in the United States, stigmatizing their bodies, minds, and blood. Through law and custom, it defined the blood of Black people as diseased and tainted and the blood of white people as unsullied and pure. It named people by proportions of blood, full blood, half-breed, mulatto, mestizo, quadroon, octoroon, mixed blood, or merely mixed. Words that attempted to make dissent legible, to mainly maintain the lie of white racial purity and to separate, immobilize, and contain non-white people along lines of color and race. It is why in some states, Black blood quantum amounted to a socio-legal disability, a prohibition of Black, a prohibition or of or disqualification from citizenship, literacy, and franchise. In others, any quantity of Black blood, even if only a drop, was enough to deny a Black, a black person rights, privileges, access, and mobility. From fugitives, for fugitives from enslavement, the cost of being caught was a loss of limb or a brand on the body. For those living during Jim Crow, lynching and racial terror loomed large. And for those of us living in the present, the disabling systemic violence inflicted on Black community stands as a dire reminder of the color line's continuity. They live in language. The contours of the color line have a discursive and material life. They live in language, and they have been exacted on the body and mind as well. To locate the disabilities of the color line, you need to know only where to search, what to examine, and how to interpret the findings once you dare to look. Next slide. This is an animated image of Frederick Douglass. The slide is a black and white um, animated image of Douglass blinking his eyes and moving his head. It was created using animating technology from myheritage.com. Frederick Douglass, who was a political abolitionist, author, orator, and the most photographed person of the 19th century, was among the first who dared to describe the color line's continuity between the antebellum and postbellum periods in terms of its varied disabilities. In June 1881, Douglas wrote an account of such continuity in his essay titled The Color Line. Next slide. And this slide includes um, two items. It's a quotation on the left from Douglas and another, one, another quotation on the right. In the quotation on the left, Douglas wrote, quote, out of the depths of slavery has come this prejudice and this color line. Slavery is indeed gone, 
but its shadow still lingers over the country and poisons more or less the moral atmosphere of all sections of the Republic." Unquote. The way Douglas saw it, slavery cast a stubborn shadow, for it also poisoned the nation with the prejudicial color line during the initial period of emancipation. Douglas primed his descriptions of color prejudice and the color line with metaphors related to disability and ethics, figuring white Americans as the primary agents of both forms of discrimination. Part of Douglas's goal was to dispel the racist idea that all Black people are inherently disabled. He also wanted to highlight how these false narratives about Black people work to maintain white supremacy and dominion by stigmatizing Black folks as physically unfit intellectually stunted and highly contagious. According to Douglas, there was hardly any place in the United States where Black folks could turn without encountering this stigma head on. In the quotation on the right, Douglas wrote, in nearly every department of American life, they, Black people, are confronted by this insidious influence. It fills the air. It meets them at the workshop and factory, when they apply for work, it meets them at the church, at the hotel, at the ballot box, and worst of all, it meets them in the jury box. In all of these spaces, the most treasured prized possessions, the right to health, to work, to worship, to shelter, to vote, to have a speedy and fair trial, were either denied or regulated by the perilous color line. It restricted where Black people could go, how they could move, what they could do, and whom they could mingle with. And its toxicity and pervasiveness produced a suffocating effect. As Douglas observed, the color line reconfigured both space and weather, poisoning the atmosphere and polluting the air that Black folks breathed. To misconstrue Douglas's remarks about the color line as merely a rejection of disability or of disabled people would be a mistake. Such an error would miss how his work and that of other Black writers and activists affirms disability as part of Black social life, despite how the discourse in production of disability and disablement historically have been used against Black people to implement pain and punishment, disdain and discrimination. Douglas's primary aim was to forge an affinity between disability and disablement in Black life between a condition, injury, or restriction, and between the process by which Black people are rendered disabled or injured through acts of violence perpetrated by anti-Black regimes. Douglas, who was born in February 1818 and died the same month in 1895, had a particular vantage point of such disabilities across slavery, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow. Throughout the course of his life and career, his view of ability and disability shifted dramatically. While the younger Douglas in 1848 misguidedly thought it was necessary for individuals to prove their capacity for rights, the older Douglas in 1881 reframed disablement as proof of rights denied, owning disability in a way that gestures toward the kind of cross-movement work that could beget liberation. Douglas's writing represents an early example of a public avowal of disability. The import and influence of his take on, on the color line, however, are often neglected. Since most scholars cite W.E.B. Du Bois, not Douglas, in their examinations of the color line. Next slide. This slide includes an image of W.E.B. Du Bois, a black man wearing a brown suit is located at the top of the slide and at the bottom of the slide, there's a quotation from Du Bois' Souls. In Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois famously declared, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. Unquote. You can sort of understand why Du Bois often gets credit for the concept of the color line. Not only is his language poetic um, and makes good use of alliteration, but also the definition of the color line is transnational in scope, given its explicit reference to, uh, to continents other than North America and Europe. 
But what I want to point out is that Douglas was also clearly a student, sorry, Du Bois was also clearly a student of Douglas, whose words inform various parts of souls and whose considerations of the color line are evident in Du Bois's description. For Douglas and Du Bois, the color line functions both as a metaphorical legal barrier and as a material literal boundary of separation and division. And for both men, the color line is just as informed by disability as it is by race. In addition to the work of Douglas and Du Bois, I would like to add another important writer that is often neglected or underexamined in discussions of the color line and disability. And that writer is the poet, fiction writer, journalist, and activist, Frances Helen Watkins Harper. Next slide. This slide includes two images. One is of the author, Frances Harper, on the left. Another, the other on the right is of the cover of her book, um, her novel, Iola Lavore. In 1892, Harper published a novel titled Ayala Leroy or Shadows Uplifted, which expands the meaning of the phrase disabilities of the color line in one of its crucial scenes, where the ex-slave Ayala Leroy explains to the white disabled Dr. Gresham why their interracial marriage would inevitably fail. Dr. Gresham, operating under the false assumption that, quote, the color line is slowly fading in our public institutions, unquote, asked Iola for the second time to be his wife. Dr. Gresham asked, quote, Iola, will you, grant, will you not grant me the privilege of holding this hand as mine all through the future of our lives, unquote. Rejecting Gresham's theory that the color line is fading, as well as rejecting his second proposal, which he couples with the thinly veiled request for her to pass as a white woman. Ayola responds to his plea with the proverbial slap in the face. Next slide. In the novel, Ayola asserts, quote, no doctor, I'm not willing to live under the shadow of concealment, which I thoroughly hate, as if the blood in my veins would undertake the crime of my soul. In her view, quote, it is easier to outgrow the dishonor of crime than the disabilities of color, unquote. Despite her distinction between dishonor of crime and disabilities of color, Ayola's reference to disabilities of color is flushed with ambiguity, rendering differences between the social and the physical, the legal and the corporeal, and the illicit and the injurious and difficult to delineate. Part of the challenge in deciphering Deciphering Ayola's precise meaning stems from how Harper framed her dialogue with Dr. Gresham. Based on the sequence of events in the novel, Harper connected Ayola's response to at least three key moments. First, Ayola's lines follow a protracted series of flashbacks about her familial and racial background, which suggests that her parents' interracial marriage the subsequent nullification of their matrimony and their ill-advised decision to conceal the Black racial identity of Iola's mother, who is strikingly fair-skinned, have a significant bearing on Iola's rejection of Dr. Gresham. Second, since her remark comes on the heels of a memory regarding the differential treatments meted out to an outcast Black girl and an outcast white girl at an asylum for fallen women, it hints at Ayola's fear of misogynoir. According to the Black feminist and disability scholars, Moy scholar Moya Bailey, misogynoir is described as, quote, the ways that anti-Black and misogynistic representation shape broader ideas about Black women, unquote, and make them vulnerable to the persistent dangers of racism and sexism. Third, Ayola's parallel between her romantic dispute with Dr. Gresham and the strife between the North and South, as well as the disabilities of white and black male soldiers, mixes the personal with the political, thereby connecting the drawbacks of interracial marriage to the injurious repercussions of the Civil War. Each of these plot details it's a clear example of what I identify as the Black literary traditions under-recognized and long-standing avowal of disability. 
These details push the reader to consider the entanglement of Blackness and disability in more expansive ways, connecting disability to slavery, the color line, the nullification of interracial, marital, and sexual unions, exclusionary institutional asylums, and the ravages of war. The novel, Ayala Livor, is not merely a work preoccupied with conventional marriage plots and romantic couplings. It is also a political text of 19th century Black feminist activism and dissent. It is a literary, literary work of antis, where anti-slavery, anti-racism, and anti-ableism sentiments swirl in abrupt and purposeful ways, but usually to dispel notions of inherent racial inferiority. In Harper's hands, the intersections of Blackness and disability are vol voluminous and wide. The words of Harper, Du Bois, and Douglas have resounded beyond the 19th and 20th centuries. If we listen closely to the commentary of Black activists in the 21st century, we hear echoes of Douglas's and Du Bois's words within their remarks about racism, police brutality, inequitable access to health care and education, and slavery's afterlife. Take, for instance, the comments of the activist and educator Brittany Packnett Cunningham who was formerly an important member of President Obama's task force on 21st century policing and of the Ferguson Commission, which was an independent group that addressed the social and economic conditions in St. Louis that propelled the protests in the aftermath of Michael Brown Jr.'s death. Cunningham, in 2020, cautioned viewers of AM Joy, a political weekend show that aired on MSNBC, not to allow the looters or the anarchy of white supremacist group who infiltrated the protests in Minneapolis to derail a vital conversation about defunding law enforcement in the wake of George Floyd's death. I would now like to listen to an audio clip of Brittany Cunningham on the show. In the next slide, you'll see Brittany on the right and then her quotation on the, on the so Brittany on the left and the quotation on the right. Next slide. Joy, this Joy, this country was founded uh, by looting. The, the, the boss, what happened in the Boston Harbor was that your founding fathers got on T-ships, looting. on looted land and was built with looted labor and it loots black light every day. Now that is not to excuse the white supremacists and the other forces that are coming in to take advantage of protests that are all about um, protests that are all about systemic racism and ending systemic racism. But what is true is that what would set all of this um, to calm and actually to peace is to deal with the conditions that cause people to react in the first place instead of spending all of this time on the symptoms. People are frankly tired of America dealing with the symptoms and not the virus. Cunningham's double entendre here is purposeful. For her reference to the virus demonstrates the entanglement of COVID-19 and systemic racism for Black people. In particular, her comparison of systemic racism to a virus is similar to Douglas's comparison of color prejudice to a disease. The starkest difference between their two statements is the nearly 139-year gap that separates them. That isn't to say that the terms in this lexicon, disability, disease, injury, or virus, are the same, but they are related. Moreover, what makes Cunningham's commentary so noteworthy is her acknowledgement of disability. Similarly to Douglas, she distinguishes the symptoms from the virus that produces said symptoms without shunning disability in the process. The circumstances that contributed to George Floyd's premature death a Cunningham's central concern, and her allusions to settler colonialism, enslavement, and police brutality implicitly outline the underlying conditions that led to Floyd's stolen Black life. Reverend L. Sharpton, the civil rights activist and founder of the National Action Network, also figured racism as a public health crisis. While delivering a eulogy at George Floyd's memorial service, here is what Sharpton said. Next slide is a video of Sharpton. Reason it got to me 
is George Floyd's story has been the story of black folks. Because ever since 401 years ago, the reason we could never be who we wanted and dreamed to be in is you kept your knee on our neck. We were smarter than the underfunded schools you put us in, but you had your knee on our neck. We could run corporations and not hustle in the street, but you had your knee on our neck. We had creative skills. We could do whatever anybody else could do, but we couldn't get your knee off our neck. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country in education, in health services, and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. Clearly, Reverend Al Sharpton had time on that day. This section of Sharpton's eulogy earned him a standing ovation. Nearly everyone attending the memorial held at North Central University stood and clapped for him. To drive his point home further, he would later add, quote, the reason why we are marching all over the world is we were like George. We couldn't breathe, unquote. Sharpton's eulogy captured how Officer Derek Chauvin was filmed kneeling on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes, in addition to the disabling and deadly pressure that racism exerts on the lives of Black people writ large. His eulogy recalled not only Eric Garner and Garner's and George Floyd's dying declarations, I can't breathe, but also the suffocation that Black folks experience due to daily racial violence. And given that Floyd tested positive for COVID-19, Sharpton's references to obstructed breathing and systemic racism would have landed bitterly with Black listeners living during a global pandemic. George Floyd's I Can't Breathe echoed an utterance of rep respiratory distress because of police brutality and the coronavirus, dual forces of destruction deadly enough to level his life. But Sharpton's empathetic pronouncement, we were like George, we couldn't breathe, transforms Floyd's singular plea into a matter of communal and collective Black suffering. Such declarations represent assertions of disability along with calls for mercy and justice. They are powerful reminders of the many ways Black lives are at risk for and on guard against state violence, and they are demands to address the terror that endangers Black lives. All of this probably resonated with Sharpton's audience. Listening to Sharpton, I also heard the resonances of Douglas, Du Bois, and Francis Harper, whose words have proven just as relevant in the 21st century as they were in the past. Their links between the disabilities of the antebellum color line and the postbellum one are significant. Equally important, though, is the way their work both harks back to and foreshadows that of other Black authors, abolitionists, and activists who are explored in my book, including David Walker, Henry Box Brown, William and Ellen Craft, Charles Chestnut, James Warden Johnson, Mamie Till Mobley, and Patricia Williams. Their affirmations of disability might strike some readers as surprising or unexpected, as an unpromising path toward combating the color line but it is not. This approach is shared by many Black folks aiming for collective liberation and yearning for another place, another time, and another possibility in the present and in the future. The remarkable stories of all the Black authors and activists in my book stand as evidence of the promising work that has engendered racial and disability justice, work that captures the full complexities of Black life, the times of grief and the times of triumph. The pursuit of racial justice entails, according to the legal and cultural studies scholar Amani Perry, holding the inescapable injustice of racism alongside the immense and defiant joy of Blackness. Next slide. The image on the right is of Amani Perry, a Black woman wearing a white shirt with her hand resting on her face, and the 
So the image on the left is the mighty prayer. The image on the right is, is Perry's quotation. As Perry asserts, the trauma endured by Black Americans is repetitive. We weep, but we are still, even in our most anguished seasons, not reducible to the fact of our grief. Rather, the capacity to access joy is a testament to the grace of living as a protest, unquote. The work of disability justice involves affirming this kind of duality too. Next slide. The top image on this slide features a disabled woman of color in a wheelchair on the left and a depiction of a rose on the right with a white banner in the center with the words sins invalid written in black. The bottom image on this slide is a quotation from sins invalid. According to sins invalid, a performance project on disability, disability and sexuality co-founded by Patty Byrne and Leroy Moore. Disability justice is an honoring of the long-standing legacies of resilience and resistance, which are the inheritance of all of us whose bodies or minds will not conform. Disability justice is a vision and practice of a yet to be, a map that we create with our ancestors and our great grandchildren onward in the width and depth of our multiplicities and histories, a movement towards a world in which everybody and mind is known as beautiful. This intergenerational dynamic framework effectively captures the work of the Black folks in my book and the desire for liberation and coalition. Indeed, the practice of Black disability world-making demands this kind of dynamism. As the feminist queer crip scholar Alison Kafer argues, quote, a politics of crip futurity must hold on to an idea of politics as a framework for thinking through how to get elsewhere to other ways of being that might be more just and sustainable, unquote. The ties that bind the stories of the Black activists and writers in my book are their politics of redress, the way they find light through darkness and healing through pain, and ultimately the way they avow the disabled beauty and abundance of Black life. It is a life that, though conditioned and constrained by the color line's long durée, is so precious and so resilient, it cannot be torn asunder. Thank you. Professor Tyler, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Um, I think I, I am speechless after, after watching it, and I think a lot of our viewers are as well. Um, we're accepting audience questions. I, I want to remind people, so please put your questions in the Q&A um, so that Professor Tyler can help address your questions. I, I would love to start us off. I will say, first of all, thank you for giving us more of the background behind the wonderful uh, cover of your book. Um, I will say that the, the richness of your book, which I, I very much enjoyed, um, is even more highlighted now that I've, and I've had your presentation, so thank you. Um, in your book, you talk about the fraught relationship between disability and race. Um, and delve into how disablement has shaped Black communities. Why is the relationship between disability and race so fraught? And what message would you want people here to take away from the, dy the dynamic between the two? Thank you for that question, Sarah. Um, I think the relationship between race and disability is so fraught because racism and ableism are intimately tied together especially during the period of slavery and Jim Crow. Um, the eras of slavery and Jim Crow produce racist narratives and practices that attempted to cast people and other people of color as inherently or innately disabled, right, or as unfit for citizenship or incapable of self-governance. This rhetoric was a way to rationalize the mistreatment of and racist behavior toward Black Americans. And I think what comes out of it, you know, in response to the rhetoric is that you have a lot of Black folks who felt the need to challenge false biological narratives tied or linked to race. Um, they wanted to dispel this notion that all Black folks are inherently disabled. But one of the things I want to emphasize is that that move, that need to, to sort of claim that um, one is not innately disabled because of their race, shouldn't be understood as an attempt to disassociate race or blackness from disability. Um, for example, some of the writers in my book might make that claim that they're not inherently disabled because of race, but they also simultaneously are saying that they do feel like they've been disabled by structural systems of oppression, which is to say they recognize how disability is inflicted on them 
So I think that distinction between, you know, disability and disablement becomes important, right? If we think of disability as a condition that restricts the movement, activities, or functions of a person, and as a legal and structural system, then disablement becomes a way for us to think about the process by which people are um, rendered disabled or injured. And I think that that distinction is useful insofar as it, you know, there's something more expansive and intersectional about that approach. You're not just thinking about one's identity or condition, but thinking about the set of circumstances that are surrounding that individual or person or group of people, as the case may be. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I think that leads me to a, a question I've been looking forward to asking you based upon uh, my reading of your of your work. And um, last November, we had uh, we hosted law and civil rights professor Dorothy Roberts on our genomics in the media video series and her books, Fatal Invention and Killing the Black Body, um, are seminal works that show how you know the social concept of race has undermined equity and justice in scientific research and the healthcare system through DNA databases, genetic testing, birth control, and more. Um, how does your scholarship into the history of disability uh, extend our knowledge of race-based discrimination within the biomedical sphere? Mm. Uh, thank you for bringing up the reference to Dorothy Roberts. Her work is incredible. I wish I could go back and look at her talk um, from that conference. Um, I mean, I you know I think the focus, my focus on ethnology, um, phonology, and eugenics um, as a way of thinking about how race-based discrimination um, functions during the historical periods that I'm talking about in my book um, gets at some of the ways that. This, this information of these practices that we might call um, harmful to the body hide behind disciplines of science. And I think part of um, what I'm trying to get at in my work, especially in terms of thinking about bioethics or even just sort of like genetics um, writ large is sort of like this, um, this move not to think about science or DNA testing or genetics as the holy grail, as the sort of final arbiter of truth. And one example of that might be in the chapter I write on Emmett Till and colorblindness. Um, just to sort of give an example, uh, in, I think it was in 2005, the FBI wanted to exhume Emmett Till's body as a way to prove that he, um, that, 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 um, his corpse was actually him <laughs> that was buried. Um, and one of the things they wanted to do was use DNA testing to prove that, um, and the argument I'm making in that chapter is that, you know, while the family disputed whether or not that was necessary, um, um, and while I understand the importance and significance and power of DNA testing, we we didn't need the FBI to exhume his body in order to do DNA testing to prove that that was Till, right? We already had evidence in front of us, particularly um, his mother, Mamie Till Mobley's testimony that that was her son's body. And so the DNA um, testing, while useful up to a point, wasn't going to tell us anything new necessarily about the, the details of that case. And so I guess that's another way of saying that I think, you know, um, the move toward using, say, these um, science and technology to answer certain questions around um, race around race and disability can are only as are only as good as like um as the intent behind it right you can, or or it's only only good to the extent that we couple that use with other forms of evidence we have at our disposal it can't be like the primary or the most significant thing at our disposal when it comes to uncovering um aspects around the body and bodily variation Thank you, and um, we'll, we'll be sure to send you Dorothy, Dorothy Roberts' talk afterwards if you still want to catch it, but um, yeah, she's wonderful as well. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of following up on um, another theme emerging from your book and also from your talk um, is about, you know, that, that this, these uh, concepts of innate and imposed disability that you mentioned earlier are distinct, but the latter is imposed by structural systems. 
Um, is that just sort of, can you talk more about what that distinction is, um, you know, and, and how do you see it currently manifested in the genomics and in genetics research communities or, or just communities, um, even maybe public communities at large who, who intersect with genomics and genetics? Hmm. Um, I mean, sort of at the, the most basic level, the, I'm trying to make a distinction between, I guess, different, different kinds of disability at work in the literature, right? So if we think of something as innate or congenital, that's one kind of disability. And some folks were, um, were talking about this earlier in the symposium about the need to have, I guess, a more robust conversation about the 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 differences in 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 our bodies and differences in our needs, whereas imposed um, disabilities is a way of thinking about, I guess, that distinction I was making earlier between disability and disablement. Right? What are the ways in which structures are in place that impose barriers or inflict harm on certain bodies and not others? Um, and and I think holding on to that distinction is important because it it attempts to give us a richer vocabulary or lexicon to think about a whole range of issues when it comes to differences um, in terms of um, not just one's disability but also one's race, sex, class, religion, et cetera. Right. So there's something about um, I guess the distinction I'm making between innate and imposed that moves us toward an intersectional framework. And, and for that, context is key, right? We, uh, we need to know more details about what has happened to an individual within a system in order to understand or help or offer assistance to that, that person or that or the group, I guess, depending on the nature of it. So, and I, I think, you know, that move toward intersectionality is, is important. It's one of the the key principles, in fact, of, uh, of, of disability justice, right? That the group I cited at the end of my talk, Sins Invalid, has this wonderful um, statement that's titled The Ten Principles of Disability Justice. And at the top of it, um, intersectionality is key. Um, they're pulling that term, obviously, I think, from Kimberly Crenshaw and others who've talked about intersectionality. But the importance there is that, or at least from Crenshaw's framing, is that we're not, intersectionality is about identity, but not only about identity, right? It's not sort of, um, it's not an oppression Olympics, if you will, right? Where like, you know, I have eight intersecting identities and Sarah, you might have 11, so therefore you win, right? That's not the goal that Crenshaw was trying to get at when talking about it. She was really trying to think about how systems of oppression make certain bodies vulnerable to discrimination, right? How structures make certain bodies vulnerable to discrimination. And that, for to, to even try to address that issue, the context is important. You have to know what's happening, why it's happening, who it's happening to. And so I hold on to that as a model I, I held on to that as a model when writing this book to think about the importance of intersectionality at every turn when I'm talking about the the writers and activists in in the text. Was there um, were there any just out of curiosity were there any writers or activists who you, who you didn't include in your book who has sort of emerged since then, you know, before you went to publishing uh, who, who you would have included had you had the opportunity. Uh, I, I cut a lot of stuff out just because I was reaching my word limit. Uh, but, uh, I, there was one writer, Elaine Locke, who I definitely want to do more work on. And I mentioned Frances Harper in the book briefly, and I also mentioned it, um, mentioned her in my talk in part because I had an idea for an entire chapter around her work that that also got cut. So cut. So she would have been another writer whose work I think would um I would have included had I had the space to write for a longer uh, a longer book. I can't imagine a historian writing too many too many words right. going over the word count. Um uh so so I I in in reading the just reading the news yesterday a, a piece came up from the New York Times um on uh, medical care alone will help the spread of diabetes um scientists say so this is about a, a new report to Congress um, on, on diabetes, the first of its kind since 1975, and, and it calls for more national policy to prevent and control diabetes, type 2 di diabetes, um, rather than placing responsibility upon individuals, um, you know, which has often been historically done. Uh, and, you know, they, they, of course, cite statistics for diabetes with 
you know, most, um, the, the, high, the highest percentage of, di of um, people affected by diabetes are, are um, Black and Hispanic adults, you know, at, at 12 and, and uh, about 12 percent respectively with 7.4 percent for white adults. Do you see do you see stories like this and reports like this as, as positive indications of change? You know, I, I think um, in considering present history, do things like this, how do they fall into the context of, of what you've examined in, in the history of the color line? Well, thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you for sharing um, that, that piece. I recently read it. I thought it was quite good. Um, I I do think that that is a positive direction uh, or, or an example of us moving in the right direction, right? Um, I think you're right to frame it as I, I move away from thinking about just the individual or placing responsibility on the individual and therefore and therefore blaming the individual for their condition or for their personal choices toward sort of thinking about structural barriers in place that prevent folks from getting access to fresh food and clean water and better health care and housing or even good air quality, right? Um, I think our approach to disability needs to be expansive and inclusive in that way. And it needs to account for and embrace bodily variations. What we know is that disability is neither monolithic or homogeneous and attempts to make them so often diminish our ability to care for our heterogeneous body minds. Um, and so, you know, that NY, that New York Times piece and, and other work that's moving in this direction makes me think that one of the key questions we need to keep at the forefront of our minds is like, what would it mean to create a world where we had access to all the things that would allow us to live productive lives? Um, to thrive and flourish, not just survive. And I think, I think I got a bit of this from Rosemary Gollin Thompson and and the the first sort of set of uh, uh, panels in the opening section, right? What it would mean to sort of do that work. Um, I think, and this and the the Sins and Valley gets at this in a slightly different way. And when they talk about disability justice, they have this great quotation. I'm looking for it now. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Our question is, um, how do we move together as people with mixed abilities, multiracial, multigendered, mixed class across the sexual spectrum when nobody mind is left behind? Right. I love that that framing because it gets at some of the some of their goals, but I think some of our goals probably at the symposium about what it means to engage in collective access and also collective liberation. Well, that's a I, I don't know that we can really follow that up with anything else. I think that's a really wonderful note to end on. Um, is there anything that uh, uh, that we didn't ask you that you that you wanted to add before we wrap up for the day? Um, uh, no, not really. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I just say I just want to say again, I'm happy to be here. Um, I found the discussion early today to be quite rich, and I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the panels tomorrow. I, I really can't thank you enough for your wonderful talk. And it, it was really so mind opening. Um, and I, I'll turn it over to our historian, Christopher Donahue. Thank you again, Professor Tyler. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Professor Tyler. Um, I don't think I can ever give a talk as good as that. That was just really unbelievable and incredible and so moving. Um, so I just want to uh, say that um, the, the conversations that we've had with, with your presentation and the other uh, presentations we've had really uh, earlier today really underscore why these conversations need to have uh, need to happen now and really should have happened a long a long time ago. So I just want to thank uh, our presenters, our moderators, the NHGRI, the NIH, uh, and our, our AV and event staff. Um, please join us uh, tomorrow beginning at 10 a.m. First, we will have an incredibly important uh, keynote, second keynote lecture uh, from Jaipreet Virdi, followed by an equally important discussion uh, panel on the interconnections between uh, ableism, scientific racism, 
and colonialism, both historical and present day, particularly in the context of genetics and genomics. Uh, and then we will have a long discussion in the afternoon really about the irreducibi irreducibility of uh, disability in the context of genetic gen genetics and genomics, and really try to think about how to move forward. And also, we will have a wonderful presentation, panel presentation on uh, how to really do uh, and work in bioethics and in disability bioethics with the participation of uh, disabled individuals uh, for the first time ever. Um, so I know uh, that we have had a lot to think about uh, and a lot to discuss. I really urge you to make sure that the conversations do not end here, that you carry with you everything that you've uh, heard uh, uh, and learned today, uh, and that you join us tomorrow for an equally informative uh, and enlightening discussion. And we are very thankful that all of you joined us here today, and we are very much looking forward uh, to seeing you uh, tomorrow morning and throughout the day. Thanks so much and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.